All right, everyone, this is uh, Michael, Krista, and Laura at the Nebraska Library Commission. If you are just joining us, we are in the last hour. I, I, I almost feel like I'm announcing a telethon at this point. Uh, with with our, oh, no, it was free. It didn't cost you a thing, just some of your time. And I got to say, this has been one of the most amazing days I've had in, in, in quite a while. Um, yeah. Uh, again, uh, hashtag BTSL. Uh, we are recording all of this, and uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit that in the questions area. Thanks one last time to our sponsors, uh, co-sponsors, ARSL, Library Renewal. Uh, all this put together through through the graciousness of uh, the folks who said, "Yeah, that sounds like a great idea to us here at the Nebraska Library Commission." I'm just going to start with a quick story leading in. And yes, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Krista, one last time. <laughs> Who? Some, some who agreed under duress, <laughs> under fear, <laughs> under worry. I, I will say some of our presenters, for, from in talking to them, this was one of the first presentations they've given. And I think I, I just everyone. do a round of applause. Everybody has done a, an amazing job. everyone rocks, um, yes. Yes. And, and to my little story here, uh, Ed, coming up on, on the at the end of January, um, I was still trying to fill all the slots for this um, event and I had the last slot of the day and I walked over to Laura's office and I said we still need somebody at the end of the day to close this off and she said well you know this morning I saw that they just announced the 2012 best library in America um, if, uh, from Library Journal and it's the Independence Public Library in Kansas and I went oh could that be more perfect or not so I, 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 I used the Google machine and I found the website for the Independence Library in Kansas, and I got a hold of their director, Julie Hildebrand, who I am going to bring up here in just a moment. Um, oops, yeah, ah, there. And yeah, there, there's, give me one sec here, audio. Uh, you know, you'd think I'd be good at this by the end of the day here. Uh, okay, we're, we're seeing your screens, and I've unmuted your mic. Julie, are you there? I'm here. Okay, and your slides are working. So uh, we'll we'll hope Jessamine isn't watching right now. Um, we were having some technical issues earlier. So uh, Julie, I am. I, I want to thank you for doing this for us. Um, and congratulations on Best Small Library in America 2012. And I'm just going to let you go right ahead and share your story with us. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited and honored to be asked to give this presentation, and I want to thank Michael for inviting me to participate. My name is Julie Hildebrand, and I am the director of the Independence Public Library in Independence, Kansas. And as you've heard, our library was chosen as the 2012 Best Small Library in America. First, I'd like to share a little bit about our library's history. We received funds from a quality of life bond issue in 2007 and were able to open our newly expanded library, which increased our public service area by over 300 percent. We were fortunate to have a library director who had previous experience building new library facilities. He brought ideas to our library that have made our building perfect as a community center. Second, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our town. Independence is a beautiful rural community with a population of just under 10,000. We have a strong unified community that prides itself on being family oriented and being hometown proud. The, down, the downturn in the economy has hit us very hard. Uh, we actually have one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. So now I'm going to tell you a horror story with a happy ending. Our story may not be exactly like yours, but you may be facing many of the same problems. I started as the library director in October of 2009. When I saw the financial statements for the first time, I was in shock. I could not believe what I was seeing. 
I realized that we didn't have enough cash on hand to continue business as usual. We would not be able to keep our library open through the end of the year unless we acted swiftly. I called in all the financial officers that we worked with from the city, our district, and our library board. We brainstormed ideas on how to avert this crisis. It came down to drastic cuts and difficult decisions. As a service organization, our largest expense is personnel. So the first thing we had to do was to cut about half of our staff. We had put a freeze on all spending, even taking on our own maintenance, which in turn had an effect on the local economy. So what was the cause of this catastrophe? It was due in part to reduced income because of increased delinquent taxes. This, of course, was an effect of the Great Recession. There was also a dramatic increase in unexpected expenses. We were in a fairly new building, but we had multiple repairs on our new equipment that, of course, had just gone out of warranty. Only through clear lines of communication and transparency were we able to survive and now thrive. But as you can imagine, this caused very low morale among our staff. Due to reduced staff, everyone had to take on more responsibility. This, of course, had an effect on morale. On any given day, you might come to our library and see the network administrator mowing the lawn or the library director cleaning the toilets. We also had to put a freeze on all vacations during the holiday season. So how do you raise morale under these conditions? First of all, the staff that remained on board were handpicked due to their positive attitudes and their willingness to do anything that needed to be done to benefit our library. We created a new teamwork approach. No more micromanaging and no more stringent rules. As the director, I still oversee and approve projects, but I definitely don't dictate every move. This is not only less stressful for the staff, it's a heck of a lot less stressful for the director. Train and then trust, that is our new team slogan. This is our team. We have eight full-time team members. We now have a brief staff meeting each morning where we find out what is happening that day or that week and how we can help each other with our different projects. We also have a weekly programming meeting where we brainstorm ideas, work out all the details of each project, and the marketing tools that we will use. We also delegate duties to all team members so that we all share the workload. Another important aspect of the meeting is to work together to develop partnerships within the community that bring our ideas to life. These meetings also create teamwork and forge close relationships. We also have three part-time team members. Jonelle is our newest member who helps us with interlibrary loans and transfers. These have increased dramatically since we have become a part of our system consortium. Like many libraries throughout the country, we're experiencing a higher demand for our services during these difficult economic times. As a community center, we not only have an increase in circulation, but we also have become a place for social connection. When we opened our new building, we had more computers. More computers brought more kids, and more kids created more problems. They were carving in our new furniture, vandalizing our elevator, and generally just running amok. There was even physical and verbal abuse toward one another and toward the staff. We spoke with local law enforcement, but like us, they were understaffed. So what was the answer? 
At that time, we decided that we would hire a security guard. When we had to cut expenses, the security guard had to go. But that wasn't all bad. With the security guard at the library, things had calmed down, but the library just didn't have that friendly atmosphere. So we had to be innovative. And we decided we'd move YA away from the adult area so that the teens had more room and freedom to socialize. And as Diane said in the previous presentation, we too found that our teens were being underserved. We decided to cut expenses further in order to have the funds to hire a new part-time teen librarian who could engage the teens in a safe, monitored environment. It was so effective that we have since made that position full-time. While things aren't perfect, where there was once a stern security guard, we now have smiling teens. Everywhere we turned, we found new problems. When we called the local police department about some homeless men that were sleeping in the bamboo behind the library, they told us that, they would have to, that we would have to issue a restraining order for them to be able to do anything about it. While we didn't want to prevent them from using the library, we just wanted to prevent them from camping in our backyard. So first thing we did was we cut down the bamboo. But then they started hanging outside the front of the library all day long. So we told them that we had a policy against loitering. And while we wanted them to be able to use the library, we didn't want them sitting outside all day. Well, they were very upset. One of them even came in and looked up the word loitering to see what it meant. They went and complained to a local minister. The church representatives then came to our library, angry that we were not allowing the homeless to use our library. Well, after we cleared up that misunderstanding, we asked them to speak with these men and explain that we're not the enemy and that we want them to be able to use our library, but it must be in a proper way. Now they are regular patrons who come in daily and benefit tremendously from our services. Instead of being entirely focused on the library, we decided to fully integrate into the community, which hadn't been done in the past. We encourage staff to join local civic groups so that the library has a presence in the community and at local events. This was done out of selfishness. We use these opportunities to promote our library, to recruit volunteers, and to create lasting partnerships. Some of our best programs have been by volunteers who we have met at these meetings. And getting involved with city events is the perfect way to get the library out into the public. And it's a lot of fun. In the past, we tried to get involved with the Chamber of Commerce. We hosted a chamber after hours, but unlike local businesses, we couldn't serve alcohol. We found that most chamber members felt that the event was boring and lackluster. We went to our city commission and got approval to serve wine and beer at the library during adult programming when it was appropriate. We have since served alcohol at several events, including a special ladies' night out. A local business that makes candles came in, and after a night of fun, food, music, and trivia, our ladies all went home with a handcrafted candle that they made themselves. And our local business ended up with new potential customers. Not only that, but the library saw many new faces. And I have to admit, I love my new candle. The needs in the community can change as quickly as the weather. It is one of my most fervent beliefs that libraries need to remain flexible and be willing to change as the needs in your community change. For example, after we won the American Dreams Architecture Library Grant, 
which allowed us to offer ESL classes, we were surprised to see people from Colombia, Burma, Iran, Iraq, Mexico, Afghanistan, Guatemala, and Turkey, to name a few, all coming into our library. We were excited. But then we began to hear comments of cultural intolerance within our community. When we realized that there was a need to create programming that introduced the public to cultural diversity and to promote tolerance, we began what we call our Meet Me In series, where volunteers in our community come to the library and present information about the countries where they are from or have traveled to. At each program, we also offer cultural refreshments. Our first Meet Me In program was Mexico. We had a local Mexican restaurant don that donated a huge five-gallon bucket of salsa. We don't have to tell you we have plenty of, left, plenty of that left over. This has become one of our most successful adult programs. It's a great way for people to learn about another country and culture and the food is always great. One of our new ideas is called Club de Café, a social and cultural club for speakers of Spanish and those who would like to learn Spanish. We meet once a month for people to practice their English and Spanish skills in a friendly, casual environment. We also offer Mango Languages which allows our patrons to learn 54 languages from any internet connection just with their library card. You can now even learn to speak pirate. And since my daughter is deaf, I was thrilled to hear that soon they will be offering sign language as well. We love Tomingo. One of the most special things about independence is that we host the largest celebration in Kansas called Neawala. This is Halloween spelled backwards. So every year as the nights get darker and the days get colder, the library gets in the Halloween spirit too. Together with the friends at the library and our local animal shelter, AWOL, we host Ghost Stories in the Park. Spooky tales are told for all ages, hot beverages are served, and in exchange for bales of hay that the audience sit on, our local animal shelter receives supplies, which are the suggested but never required admission fee. So, for a roll of paper towels, people in our community can experience a unique Halloween treat. Another need we saw in our community was for an annual Christmas event with a community tree and fun for the kids, but it needed a library hook. We decided that for each book that a child read in the month of November, that they would earn a library buck. The money they earned reading books could then be used to buy gifts for their friends and family at our new Christmas tree lighting and holiday festival. This was much more successful than we ever could have imagined. It is like putting on another summer reading program because the kids read thousands of books during the month of November to earn their bucks. There was no way that the library could afford to put on a wonderful program like this and be able to provide gifts for all the books read. So we hit the ground running. We received donations from local businesses, and with generous support from the Friends of the Library, we are now able to do this program annually. So every year, the people in our community get to enjoy a performance by our award-winning high school ensemble, see the lighting of our beautiful 16-foot Christmas tree, and they get to eat all the homemade Christmas cookies that they want. There is always fun things for the kids at the holiday festival, but this year we wanted to offer something for the adults while the kids were enjoying their activities. We decided to incorporate a holiday market. We invited local artists to set up booths with items for sale. 
We wanted this to help promote local business, so we did not charge any fee. Next year, we plan to offer a civic group fair, where they will be able to set up a booth and share information with the public about their organizations and offer door prizes. The festival continues to grow in popularity. In 2011, we had over 500 people that came to our library to enjoy the festivities. One thing I would like to mention is that we rely solely on volunteers to help us run this event. Without their dedication, we would never be able to pull off a festival this size at our library. These are a few of the programs that we have had recently or have, will have coming up soon. You may feel that your library wouldn't be able to conduct programming on this scale because you already have so much to do, but you can do it too by developing partnerships with local businesses, citizens, civic groups, and city officials who are usually very willing to conduct programs at the library for the public. By becoming involved with organizations in your community, you become aware of diverse needs that you can address, such as helping people save money by uh, using an extreme couponer to teach a program on couponing, or offering help with employment by having an employment agency conduct a workshop on interviewing skills. The possibilities are endless. If you develop partnerships with local businesses, you not only help your local economy, but you help your library by advocating that you are an indispensable community center. One of the needs we have seen in our community is the need for summer programs that the entire family can enjoy. Our school district had to cancel summer school for the past two years due to reduced funding. So we have focused on filling this gap. Some people may ask what having a food-themed carnival has to do with library services. Well, I would tell them that young families are the future, and if we don't get them involved in using our library, we become irrelevant. When we offer these programs, we see our regular patrons, but we always have new people signing up for library cards. We often have people who are astounded at all the fun things that our library has to offer. The more people you have using the library for whatever reason, the more support that you will see in your community. The way you advertise a program can make or break it. An eye-catching poster or handout is one of the most important aspects of marketing. This is one of my favorite handouts. We had a local comic artist, Mike Hall, design this super cool advertising tool that targets teens to get them motivated to participate in our new year-long nutrition program that we call Kids vs. Plants. The kids are very excited about it, and so are we. When you design a year-long program, it's important to design a handout like this to let them know what's happening. Keeping things consistent helps. It is also important to remain flexible because, as we all know, stuff happens. And you also need to realize that not every program will be successful, but honestly, don't sweat it. If you don't try new things, you will miss out on so many opportunities. Take your library apart, piece by piece, and figure out how you can use social networking to promote awareness for all your services. By putting all the pieces back together using a social network, 
it creates a new organism that includes not only the library, but thousands of other people from everywhere. Now I'm going to show you our library cat, Trixie's blog and Facebook page to give you an idea of how you can create a rapport with your patrons. So this is Trixie's blog. Here she says, in case you didn't know, I'm the library cat at the Independence Public Library in Kansas. Thanks to me, the library was named the 2012 Best Small Library in America. And here is Trixie's Facebook page. And as you can see, we have patrons that comment or like nearly all of the posts. Here she said, we play music in the library, but not my favorite kind, which is punk rock. We had six people that liked this comment. Trixie has a number of faithful followers that read her pages daily. Trixie's blog and Facebook page are updated by Trixie with the help of our children's librarian, Glenn Sheffield. Your Facebook page doesn't have to just list your programs like book discussion tonight, 7.30. Ask questions, share interesting stories and links, whatever you can do to get the conversation started. We play a lot of Facebook trivia and give out prizes that are donated by local businesses. It's a win-win. You are no longer just a building full of books. Interaction gives your library a beating heart. One of the things we had been trying to do was to design an advocacy campaign for our library. We spent many hours shouting out slogans like, get brain punched at the library. Honestly, most of our ideas really sucked. Then, OCLC created the Geek the Library campaign, which was the solution to our dilemma. I'm just going to share one of their videos with you. My best friend asked me to join his jump rope team in high school. I thought it was a joke at first. A year later, we were performing at NFL stadiums. Jump rope requires athleticism, precision, and creativity. When you get that adrenaline rush from performing in front of a thousand people, you know you love what you're doing. My name's Nathan, and I do jump roping. And then at, this is uh, geekthelibrary.org. And this is the public we uh, website. If you go to get.geekthelibrary.org, this is their website for librarians. Once you sign up to participate, they send you a kit to get you started, loaded with promotional items like t-shirts, posters, bumper stickers, and more. Anything and everything that you will need for an effective advocacy campaign is included in their website. We couldn't be happier with our Geek the Library campaign. People are excited and constantly asking us for Geek the Library promotional items. One of the best investments we ever made is our button machine. It hasn't earned much income as a fundraiser, but it's been priceless in advertising for our library. We make buttons for all of our major programs and hand them out when we go to community events. We have also created several designs that we sell at the circulation desk. I always get a kick out of seeing our buttons when I'm out and about in Independence. All of our hard work has paid off. 
We hear positive comments about our library every day. We finally feel like we're a part of the community, and we've been welcomed with open arms. Even during these tough times in our community, our community supported an increase in our budget so we can expand our hours and continue to offer our great services. How to prepare for your presentation to funding authorities is quite involved, and I won't go into that now, but I will have some information available online for you, and I'm going to share that link later. And because of our community involvement, our friends organization received a substantial endowment, which we hope will allow us to do even more. None of this would have happened without effective advocacy and partnerships. And if we can do it, I know that you can do it too. But it's, just, it's not just your local community that can help you. A couple of our best resources are the State Library and our Regional Library System. Our system library offers grants, advice, and support, which has been a tremendous resource for us. Without help from our system director and consultants, things around here would be much different. We have also joined our regional consortium, which has allowed us to offer an expanded level of service that we could not have afforded otherwise. Writing a grant can be very intimidating, but honestly, it's easier than it looks. Again, if we can do it, you can do it. And when your funding sources see that you're exploring, exploring additional funding options, they are going to be more inclined to support you. I had no experience in writing grants, but I was still able to pick up skills and have been awarded some very nice ones. Be creative, brainstorm ideas, collaborate, and if you need help, there's a webinar for that. One of the reasons we have been so successful is that we have a very supportive board. I keep them informed about all the good stuff, let them know about the not so good stuff, and try to keep it interesting and fun. At your board meetings, try to bring some new information to share with them that will help them to be more effective in their roles. I am constantly learning about what the board's role is and the librarian's role. And when those lines get crossed, it can create chaos. Be particular who you recommend for your board. Getting one negative voice brings the whole vibe down. Check to see if your state library offers public library board certification and get your board certified. Even if your state doesn't offer certification, it's important to offer training and orientation for your trustees. One great resource that we've used is called Trustee Trouble, created by the Wyoming State Library. These fun, innovative videos have been a hit with our board members. To remain relevant, libraries must keep up with technology. We are in an information age where people can transfer information freely and have instant access to information that would have been difficult or impossible previously. This digital revolution has changed our economy and our workforce. As libraries, we need to be aware of this evolution and provide access to information in ways that the public expect and need. Not only that, we must help with workforce development as jobs that were traditionally middle class are beginning to disappear because of outsourcing and automation. These workers must learn new technologies to remain employable, or many times they have to settle for low-wage jobs 
or remain unemployed. One great resource to help with this issue is Web Junction. Web Junction's Project Compass program is to help support public libraries' efforts to meet the urgent and growing needs of communities impacted by the economic downturn. Sometimes people expect librarians to know everything. We know that that's not possible, but with the right resources, we can certainly try. Like many library directors and small libraries, I do not have my MLS. My background is in business, accounting, and computer science. Although it is my goal to earn my master's degree, I have to ask myself what will benefit our library more now, spending my time working toward my degree or taking classes and training that will teach me the skills that I need to know now. One of the things that I admire most about this profession is the collaboration. This online conference is a perfect example of timely instruction that will benefit our library now. Before I was asked to be a speaker, we had already signed up three of our staff members to attend. We take advantage of continuing education opportunities for all of our staff. One of our future goals is to partner with the Science and Technology Center here in Independence to create our own fab lab. Lauren, I want to thank you for your inspiring presentation. I had previous, previously viewed your YouTube videos about the Fab Lab in Fayetteville, New York, and was so excited I've been telling everyone I know about MakerBots. There are some kids that come to our library that have advanced computer skills. I would love to see what they can do if they were allowed to test out new cutting-edge technologies. Every day, there is a new opportunity, challenge, or experience. Embrace change. Try new things. Explore opportunities. I am setting up a new blog that I'll use to share many of the resources that have helped us. It will be 2012BSL for Best Small Library .blogspot.com. I will post a copy of this presentation for you to review, including my notes that coincide with all the slides. And I'll try and keep this updated with uh, more information and current information as we find new things. And hopefully you will share resources with us that have helped your library. Feel free to email me with any comments or questions. And you can friend me on Facebook. I tend to share a lot of library-related links on my personal Facebook page. Our library's website is IPLKS.org. You can find links to our social media, our, our new online book discussions, and all of our new program information. This is our next Meet Me In program, Meet Me in Iran, on March 1st. We're looking forward to that. I love working as a librarian. You know, there are bad days, and it's not always easy, but I tell you, it is never boring. Facing difficulties with a positive attitude, creating a collaborative environment, and fostering teamwork will help all of us be successful. So I hope this horror story with a happy ending has inspired you and has shown how a library can come back from the dead. So now I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Julie, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, I, I, will, I will tell everybody li listening that as, as I asked each of our speakers, I kind of 
suggested a topic or I, you know, I heard you, you, you're, you're going on this topic. So I really had, at this end, we didn't have really any idea what all of our speakers were going to be actually saying. We didn't see their slides in advance. We just had a general topic. And Julie, that was spectacular. It mm -hmm. tied it all together, I think, wonderfully. We're just going to sit at, looking at each other here going, this was perfect. Um, and to all of our speakers, it's been wonderful. I do believe we have a couple of questions we for do Julie. We have a couple of okay. questions. Um, some rather practical, um, nitty-gritty kind of questions. Um, when you have the events where you serve alcohol, how do you handle the insurance? Um, insurance? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I guess it's going to we depend have, on your locality. We have a staff member who checks IDs. Um, we only allow people in the program that are 21 and older. Uh -huh. um, we only serve a half a glass, usually, per person. Um, so there's really no uh, issues. Well, and the, the uh, city commission has approved that uh, we can serve alcohol here at the library. Yeah, yeah. Check check with your local uh, uh, constabulary or, or city council Isn't or whatever there, as to what what the rules are in your location. I would believe. Where was it? I think it was in the Chicago suburbs where you could get a one event liquor license. Omaha non, Public does that. Too. Yes, yes that's yeah. where it is. Yeah, a one day liquor. They license. They can get a one day yes. liquor license. So maybe that's some, something that people do. Sure. Um, Okay, we have somebody who wonders about the security guard. Uh, you said at one point that you had one, but you kind of had to let him go. Um, have you had more security issues, or do you feel that you've handled them now, or have you rehired a guard? Uh, we have not rehired a guard, and we don't plan to. Actually, we've moved the teen area up to the third floor. Um, we have, they have more room up there. They can make more noise. Um, and it doesn't affect uh, all the rest of the library. We also have the full-time librarian who's right there with them. And so she's able to handle most everything. Well, of course, we still do have some issues. And sometimes we have to ask the kids to leave the library. But it's a lot less often than it was in the past. Great. Uh, I, somebody is saying, was there a, one particular program that helped you uh, that you feel helped you get the 2012 Small Libraries Award? Well, it was a number of things. Um, if you go to their website, you'll see what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I think that they were looking for was a library that was a community center. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the things that I mentioned in the program today has to do with how we are providing services to our community more than just uh, your typical library. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things they were looking for. Also, we provided a number of statistics, which I think they were pretty impressed with. Um, we, were, we were involved in the impact study, which was a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation study. Yeah. And that talked about um, the technology usage in our library, and it was pretty impressive. It surprised us even. Great. Uh, okay, and I have a comment here. Thanks for the ideas, Julie. I just started at my library two months ago, and I'm feeling like I'm bringing it back from the dead. So thanks again. <laughs> so you've you've been an inspiration. No, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, anything I can do to help. Okay. Uh, someone is especially interested in um, your program called Sunflowers and Stories and the Oral History Street Fair. Can you tell, say a little bit more about that? Well, the Sunflowers and Stories is um, a fairly new program. This will be our second year. Um, we have, this year we're going to have a professional storyteller come and tell stories. We do this outside, um, and then afterwards, she is going to be conducting a storytelling workshop for uh, local teachers and librarians in our area. Um, we also have a number of sunflower-related crafts and games, like a sunflower seed spinning contest and things like that. 
So the kids absolutely love it. They have a lot of fun. Um, Sounds like fun. What was the other program? The o Oral History Street Fair. What was the other program? The Oral History Street Fair. This is something. Yes, this is something brand new that we haven't done yet, but that we're planning on. Um, and we plan on closing off the street in front of the library and setting up booths where uh, patrons can come and um, scan documents, we'll record family histories, that we'll be able to take photographs and record audio as well. Um, and we, we're just in the planning stages, so um, we're not exactly sure what all we'll be doing but we'll be partnering with a number of organizations in independence, and it will be a, an annual event. Sounds great. Do we have anything else? No more audience questions? Not at the moment. All right, Julie, thank you one more time. That, that was wonderful. Uh, really appreciate all the time and the effort that you put into this, and congratulations on the award, uh, most oh. definitely. And, and, and thank, thank you. For for finding the time to uh, do this for us. So with that, folks, I think we are going to wrap up the day. This is a, we, We've never done an eight-hour uh, webinar before. And so uh, let me go just uh, do a little bit of a um, switch around here. And we're going to put that there. Um, showing anything and that's okay sorry hold on we're screwing things up there we go um we want to thank everybody who attended today um this was uh something that we've been putting together over the last couple of months and uh, a bunch of work went into it and we were hoping we would pull off the day with uh, kind of a minimal amount of technical difficulty and i i think we hit the, the threshold of minimal amount of technical difficulty we had a yeah, couple yeah. of issues here and there but uh we, we got around them and actually pretty much stayed on schedule that's that's the other thing so thank you again to all the speakers for 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 helping us to do that um i want to thank uh again arsl and library renewal our co-sponsors for helping us with marketing and putting this show together and special thanks to uh the folks here at the nebraska library commission for allowing us to to put this together uh, Laura, Krista, and I, I think, uh, all appreciate that. Um, we have been, according to the software, recording all of this. <laughs> so uh, everybody cross your fingers, and uh, we'll see tomorrow morning how the, the recording and the, the processing of the recording happens, and then we get to start editing this all down. So please uh, give us uh, some time to get the presentations together, the extra links together, especially the videos uh, with our travel schedules and things coming up. It might take um possibly up to two three weeks but we, we will get stuff up at, online as fast as possible um about an hour after we finish this everybody who registered and attended and logged in will receive an email that is your kind of proof of attendance should you need that for any sort of ce uh from your state and also will contain a link to a survey monkey survey evaluation of the event we really I uh, do want to hear from you about what you thought of that. Um, if for some reason you don't get that email, first thing tomorrow morning, we'll make sure that on the website, as we're showing you here now, uh, that we will uh, get a link to that survey up. We know now everybody got the login emails. Somebody's probably not going to get the evaluation email. Um, the system does what it does and, and you know spam filters catch it and things like that. So, uh, Chris or Laura, do you have anything? Uh, have I um, missed anything, do you think? No, it's been a great day. I hope people have enjoyed it as much as we did. Oh, I'm jazzed. I, yeah. I thought I thought I was going to be I, I, okay. I'm exhausted. I will admit that from running this thing, but I'm I'm just you know really excited and and uh, yeah, I I picked some up some great ideas. Krista, do you want to say anything? You're good. Yeah. Thank you. She's smiling. So 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 we'll do that. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to officially call this a day and an event. Thank you all for attending, and we will leave, go to webinar kind of up and running for the next few minutes as people log in. Are we, we getting? We have comments? a last question that says next year question mark. Next year question mark. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm excited. Um, <laughs> I this this both took more and less work than you might expect uh, uh, on things. Um, let's just say I I have intentions. It's, it's, it's 
not out of the realm of possibility. Yes, yes, it has been discussed, and you know we're going to go through the evaluations. One of the questions on the email is, if we did this again, what would you like to hear about? Yeah. So you know, um, we are actually considering it. So uh, well, ask us again after we've had a good night's sleep. <laughs> so <laughs> we truly would like to hear your evaluations yes. because. Um, Actually, that's probably what will determine whether we do it again next year or not. Exactly. And do check back on the website. Uh, that's where the uh, recordings will be when we get them edited. Yep. Um, and if we have more news, we'll probably mm -hmm. put them there. Yep. And so there will be a presentation page. I, my plan is to kind of have a page for each session underneath that where we'll have the recordings. We generally do audio versions, links. PowerPoints, anything we can get from our presenters, we'll, we'll coordinate with them and pull that all together and, and just look for it there. We have no intention of taking the site down in the near future. Um, and, you know, if we do it again, we'll probably just continue using the same site. So, thank you all. It was a wonderful day. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording and say goodbye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.